Okay, good morning. Let's get uh, started. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so let me remind you that last time we introduced uh, the concept of the relative dielectric permittivity for dielectric media. This table shows you some uh, representative values for air, for example, the dielectric permittivity, the relative dielectric permittivity, epsilon sub r, is equal to almost one. So air practically behaves uh, like empty space, vacuum. Um, petroleum oil, 2.1. Uh, quartz, a very popular dielectric material, uh, 3.8 to 5. Glass, 4.5 uh, to 10. So what does this represent, this relative dielectric permittivity, epsilon sub r, which, by the way, gives also rise to the quantity that we call dielectric permittivity and dielectric permittivity epsilon without any subscript is epsilon naught times epsilon sub r, epsilon naught being the dielectric permittivity of vacuum, what we have seen in all our formulas so far when we were deriving fields and potentials in vacuum, epsilon naught. And now you see that this now for a dielectric material is increased by a factor epsilon sub r. So what is the physical explanation of this factor and what is the physical role of this factor? Let me uh, remind you uh, what we said uh, last time to introduce uh, today's lecture as well. So if we start, and th that is uh, the easiest way to understand what happens in dielectrics, let's start from a, a non-polar dielectric, which macroscopically looks like positively um, charged nuclei that are surrounded by electrons. And we have also an empty capacitor. Uh, we haven't formally defined capacitors yet, but this is a parallel plate system, which we have charged the upper plate with a positive charge Q, the lower plate with a negative charge Q. And we have found that the electric field lines will be, the electric field actually will be constant within this structure and will be pointing as expected from the positive to the negative plate. So now what happens if we slide this dielectric inside this uh, parallel plate? The uh, positive uh, nuclei will be attracted by the negative plate and the negative electrons will be attracted by the positive plate. And therefore, we will have now a deformation of uh, this uh, molecular structure inside the dielectric. And that will result in two things. First of all, you see now this will look like Dipoles, uh, you remember uh, this uh, structure of the electric dipole that we had uh, discussed with the, the positive and the negative charge pairs. So this will be uh, looking like, so these uh, dielectrics will be looking like uh, filled with dipoles. So you see these dipoles will go all the way up to here. Let me emphasize there will be these negative charges at the top. So they go, they go all the way to the surface, those negative charges. And also uh, to the bottom, those positive charges. So the entire volume of the dielectric is now filled with these sort of dipoles which have come from this deformation of the molecules. Why deformation only and not current? Because dielectrics by definition are materials where all charges are bound to their nuclei. And therefore we can only have deformation in this case. Imagine that you have masses that are attached to a spring. And the spring is strong enough so that when you exert a force and you try to displace the masses, then 
the masses will be displaced but the spring will stay in place and therefore it won't break. Of course, that happens up to a point. We will discuss this in a little bit. But up to that point that we have just this deformation, we have this phenomenon of dielectric polarization, which means that now the uh, dielectric appears as it has been filled with electric dipoles. And we have two phenomena that are represented by this relative dielectric permittivity. First of all, those dipoles will have their own field. And remember the external field points downwards like this. But those dipoles, as you see, have their positive charges to the bottom and the negative charges to the top. And always the electric field lines point from the positive to the negative. And therefore, those dipoles themselves will create a field that is opposite to the external field. So here we have something that reminds us of the action-reaction principle in mechanics, whereby you have an external field that polarizes the dielectric, and then that dielectric now creates its own field that resists the external field. So you see that we are expecting that the net electric field decreases. And the factor by which the net electric field in this capacitor decreases is actually what we call the epsilon sub bar. That is the role that is played by this epsilon sub bar, the relative dielectric permittivity that we saw some representative values before. You can also see that effectively one could actually interpret this effect a little bit differently. We could say that and that is an alternative interpretation. That we have here this uh, subway train effect, whereby these dipoles are pushing against each other. And within the volume, their charges cancel out. So the volume of this dielectric effectively is still as if you had um, an empty space because those charges are so close to each other, the positives and the negatives, that effectively they cancel each other out. However, just like it happens, especially in Japanese subways, some people pushing each other, some people end up through the windows or through the doors. And that's exactly what happens here at the top. And you see that at the top, you have some negative charges protruding to the surface on this side and some positive charges from the dipoles protruding to the surface on this side. So I can also see this effect as actually resulting in a capacitor that simply has fewer charges to create the field and as a result the net charge on the plates reduces out of this interaction between the free charges that existed before at the conductors of the plates of the capacitor and now those charges that have been created out of this polarization. So either if you see this as dipoles creating microscopic fields that are cancelling the external fields or if you see it as charges being created that now interact with the initial free charges that created the field and the net, and the net charge that creates the field goes down, the conclusion is the same. The net electric field goes down and that interaction can be actually uh, uh, described in a concise way because you see this is a very complicated microscopic phenomenon 
uh, that we are very lucky to be able to describe in a very compact way with what we call the relative dielectric permittivity epsilon sub bar of the material. And we can simply say that this shows how much the electric field will decrease once I insert the dielectric. So uh, these effects now that the net electric field reduces or that the net charge that creates the field reduces can be described by this joint effect can be described by an update on Gauss's law. So Gauss's law In the most general form, so far we have seen that only in free space, becomes, you remember Gauss's law takes the integral of the electric field through a closed surface S, so we have this general closed surface S that of course, the law talks about a general surface, but we have seen also in the applications of Gauss's law what particular forms this surface can take in order to result in uh, field calculations. So epsilon dot ds is equal now to enclosed Q divided by epsilon naught times epsilon r. So you see, because of this factor, we are capturing both effects. That because of the polarization charges, the net charge reduces by epsilon r. And because of this reduction, also the electric field will go down. And um, another way to write this in an even more compact form is by taking this epsilon naught epsilon r to the uh, right, to the left, sorry. Right. And then defining this as D, the electric flux density vector, uh, remember in the beginning I, uh, on uh, my slides I uh, defined this uh, product as dielectric permittivity epsilon. So epsilon r is the relative, this is the actual dielectric permittivity of the material. So D equals epsilon E is the electric flux density in its general form. And the units are Coulomb per meter squared. So effectively, the only thing that changes in our previous calculations is that now we can apply Gauss's law for the D vector and then from that find the corresponding electric field. So let me give you an example. And uh, I will again do the coaxial cable. So we have one cylinder here of radius A, another cylinder of radius B, and now, in between the cylinders, I'm putting a dielectric epsilon equal to epsilon naught epsilon r. Okay. And uh, I want to find the electric field. So let this cable have length L. And this is the z axis. So the cable runs along the z-axis. And uh, I have over this uh, uh, length L charge plus Q on the inner conductor and minus 
Q on the outer conductor. So this is an example. Uh, we did a very similar one for Gauss's law uh, in free space, in vacuum. So we want now to find the electric field. in the dielectric. So just to turn this upside down so that we see it. Uh, <coughs> this is the cable. This is the axis. This is the inner radius A and the outer radius B. We're being told that uh, the cable has charge Q over length L in the inner conductor and minus Q in the outer conductor. So this, this means that there is a surface charge density on the inner conductor. And I should add that this is uniformly distributed. That means there is a surface charge density, right? There is a surface charge density on the inner conductor. Uh, Rosa Bess. at r equals a, which is q divided by the area of the inner conductor, which is 2 pi a times the length l of the cable. So we're being told that we have this uh, charge q in the inner conductor. The inner conductor has surface 2 pi a times l. a is the radius. All right, so therefore, the surface charge density will be uh, Q divided by 2 pi A L. You see, this is still a problem with cylindrical symmetry. So we have cylinders, we have a uniform material in between. Therefore, there is cylindrical symmetry in the problem. And because of this symmetry, this is one case where we can use Gauss's law to find the electric field. Remember that Gauss's law is universally true. However, it's only useful for field calculations if there is a symmetry in the problem, spherical, rectangular, or cylindrical. Here, it so happens that there is actually that kind of symmetry. And hence, I can apply Gauss's law. And because, you see, we have in the introduction of epsilon sub bar, retained the original form of Gauss's law. All our assumptions, everything we've said about Gauss's law in free space is now uh, holding in the case of dielectrics. And just as I said that when you have cylindrically, cylindrical symmetry, the electric field points in the radial direction and depends only on the radial coordinate, now the same assumption is inherited by the d vector, the electric flux density vector that I can say that it points in the radial direction and can only depend on the radial coordinate. So properties of E are inherited by D because these are related with a linear relationship. So the properties of the one are inherited by the other. And uh, in this case, 
I need now to apply uh, Gauss's law on a surface. Which surface would I choose? Any ideas? A cylinder, yes. It's uh, now sort of trivial that I need to go and apply this on a cylinder. of uh, height h. So cylindrical symmetry suggests I need to uh, use a cylinder for Gauss's law. And now, instead of the electric field, I'm putting in the d vector. So you see the only change, we have here a really mild change of what happens in dielectrics versus in free space with, instead of using the electric field, using this d vector. And um, on this cylinder, d dot ds will be, I take the form of dr. I'm looking for the differential surface elements in cylindrical coordinates that point in the radial direction. And there is only one of them. And that one of them is R d phi dz. There is only one surface element. If you go to your age sheet, there is only one surface element that points in the radial direction. It's the R d phi dz. And uh, you see this r dot r gives you 1. This is an indication that indeed we uh, picked the right element. And you see d phi will vary from 0 to 2 pi, dz from 0 to h. And otherwise, I have, you see, I don't integrate with respect to r. r is fixed because I'm having a cylinder. So this is a constant, and this is a constant. So these come out of the integral dr of r, and then integrating d phi from 0 to 2 pi gives me 2 pi. Integrating dz from 0 to h gives me h. So this is the left-hand side. And now the right-hand side is the enclosed q without any epsilon not in the denominator. And I have to emphasize, and I have to emphasize that this enclosed Q is now the charge on the conductor. So you see, by using epsilon r, we have already embedded into the equation the phenomena of dielectric polarization. So we don't need to count those microscopically uh, formed charges. That's the whole point of this epsilon r. This epsilon r makes it easy for us to account for these microscopic effects in a very nice macroscopic, macroscopic way. And what is here as enclosed Q is actually the charge that would have created the field in free space, what we call the free charge, the charge that exists on the conductors of this coaxial cable. So this Q enclosed is basically equal to the Rosa Bess, the surface charge density, times the area of this cylinder of radius r. Uh, sorry, the area of uh, the inner cylinder of radius a, that's the one that, uh, uh, um, that uh, carries uh, the charge. So 2 pi a times h. So the charge is on the inner cylinder only. So h and h cancel out, 2 pi and 2 pi cancel out, and then I have that dr is rho s times a over r. And then from this one, I find that the electric field which is 1 over epsilon or epsilon r d is equal to
R. Okay, and uh, we can uh, express this in terms of uh, Rosa Bess in terms of the um, geometry, in which case also the alphas will cancel out. So this is the final form of the electric field. So the message here is we apply Gauss's law for D and then we find the electric field from that. Any questions up to this point? So further updates for dielectrics. Modification of other equations we saw in free space. Gauss law in differential form <laughs> differential form of Gauss law. Uh, we had seen uh, the uh, form in free space. that uh, divergence of the electric field is volume charge density by epsilon naught. So now in the dielectric, you can see the modified form of uh, Gauss's law, that is uh, uh, d dot ds is q enclosed, and that means that in the dielectric, the law becomes divergence of d is rho sub v, no other constants. So divergence of the d vector of the electric flux density is equal to rho sub v. Um, along with uh, the dielectric, with uh, Gauss's law, we had derived the Poisson and Laplace equation. So I have to give you a modified form now for the dielectrics. So the, um, the Poisson equation was starting from uh, the relation between electric field and potential. That is rooted actually in the relation between the work of the electric force and the potential. And hence, it, is not, it doesn't change in or outside dielectrics. So that the electric field equals minus gradient of V is true in dielectrics. It has nothing to do with this uh, phenomena that uh, we saw for uh, polarization. And, uh, and uh, therefore, when we go and do divergence of d equals to rho sub v, we can now replace d with uh, the electric field times the dielectric permittivity. So that's where the dielectric permittivity enters. And now the electric field I can replace with the gradient And I can take the minus sign outside, and that's uh, the general form now of the Poisson equation. So the Poisson equation has this general form, divergence epsilon gradient of V equals to minus rho sub V. And then we have the two simplifications. First simplification is when there is no volume charge density. So if rho sub v is zero, 
then this becomes divergence of epsilon grad v is equal to zero. And then uh, third simplification is when now the dielectric permittivity epsilon is constant throughout space. If it is constant throughout space, then I can take it out of the divergence because it's a differential operator. If epsilon is space dependent, then I cannot take it out. I have to keep it inside. So if epsilon is constant, then I can take it out. In fact, it cancels out in this case, and I have divergence of gradient of V, which is the Laplacian of V equals to zero, and this is the Laplace equation. So now we have updated all equations for dielectrics in the presence of some dielectric permittivity, and you see that it really boils down to something very simple that instead of uh, working with the electric field directly, you, you're working with D, and then the electric field is D divided by dielectric permittivity. And that is the end of the story. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so I have to um, add two things about dielectrics. The first is the dielectric breakdown so what is a dielectric breakdown as you know air is a good dielectric is a great insulator there are no currents through air however there is a case where actually currents are formed and that is the effect of lightning. So what happens in lightning? It happens what we formally call dielectric breakdown. That is, if you take a dielectric, you put it in an electric field, Then, as long as the electric field is strong, but not too strong, you have here the formation of a dipole. So this is being deformed, and you have the formation of a dipole like this. But if you keep increasing the electric field, If, for example, you have it inside the capacitor and you keep increasing the voltage, you go to kilovolts, 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 then eventually this will break free, these electrons break free from uh, their positive nuclei and from that point on, they are able to move under the external electric field. So that's exactly what happens uh, in the uh, case of this dielectric breakdown, where now the electric field growing exerts a greater and greater and greater force, just like when you have uh, two masses attached to a spring, and then from one point on, the spring breaks, and then the masses are able to move. In that case, now the dielectric becomes a conductor because the charges, if you can uh, produce a little bit less noise, please, up there, if you can produce a little less noise, that would be great, much appreciated. So from one point on, then those charges can actually move and the dielectric behaves as a conductor. This is exactly what happens in the formation of lightning. When a charged cloud attracts positive charges to the ground,
And now you have the formation in nature of a capacitor between the cloud and the ground and an electric field that keeps growing in strength and at some point it can exert such a force to gas molecules that they can break free, the electrons can break free of uh, their molecules and they can form a current all the way from the cloud to the ground. So in this case, air, which is a natural dielectric, behaves as a conductor and you see as if there is a wire that connects the uh, charge to the ground. When does this happen in air? This requires three kilovolts per millimeter or uh, uh, three mega volts per meter if you convert this to volts per meter. Uh, in dielectrics, and that is an important application of dielectrics, this field strength actually grows. So the minimum um, strength uh, of the field, the minimum electric field magnitude that causes dielectric breakdown in, uh, occurs in air, and then in dielectrics, I had it uh, up before. Let me uh, unmute the projector so that instead of uh, writing the numbers, I can project the numbers here. So you see air, 3 megavolt per meter, glass, 25 to 40 megavolt per meter, quartz, 30 megavolt per meter. So that is another uh, application of dielectrics that when we insert them in structures like capacitors, then they can sustain higher voltages because otherwise if I have just air between the plates at three kilovolts uh, per at three kilovolts per millimeter, three megavolts per meter, then uh, I will have uh, simply a spark and uh, the, the air will become a conductor and will basically short circuit the two plates of the capacitor. So that is uh, another important thing to be emphasized. I can give you an example. Uh, with a dielectric breakdown. So that is uh, the uh, parallel plate capacitor, just to uh, put some numbers there. Let's mute the projector. Um, with uh, air. Uh, let's say that uh, we have a separation between the plates of uh, one centimeter. So this is the parallel plate capacitor that we are talking about. One centimeter. Uh, the electric field, remember, for uh, a capacitor with voltage V0, and uh, separation D, the electric field points always in the direction of decreasing potential and its magnitude is V0 over D, V0 over D. Uh, so that means that for air, the maximum voltage that you can carry meets the uh, dielectric breakdown limit of three uh, megavolts per meter. So it is three times 10 to the six
volts per meter. Uh, so that means that it is uh, 30 kilovolts per meter. Uh, sorry, 30 uh, kilovolts. Uh, the meters I have multiplied by meters, so I don't need this anymore. So it's 30 kilovolts. On the other hand, if I put in quartz, quartz actually has a, a breakdown field strength that is 10 times that of air. So it is 30 kilovolts per meter. per millimeter or 30 megavolts per meter. And therefore, the maximum voltage that I can apply also goes up by a factor of 10 and becomes 30 kilo, uh, 300 uh, kilovolts. So we're talking about quite high voltages that can be uh, carried. So this is uh, one uh, major application of dielectrics. And of course, another one is very practical, that when we make capacitors, we want a strong, uh, we need a strong um, material on which the two plates will be attached. And therefore, you have a, a mechanically a strong uh, structure. So this is all I had to say about dielectric breakdown. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. In this case, right, uh, like, does the quartz, quartz have a specific distance all the time, or does it vary, like, the D of the quartz? What's the value? No, no, I'm saying that you have here a constant separation of one centimeter, and then you bring, you bring a, a quartz plate in between. So in both cases, I keep the distance the same, one centimeter. Why does that? Because the breakdown field strength increases by a factor of 10. So the maximum electric field that I can sustain before a spark is formed inside the dielectric is now not 3 megavolts per meter, but 30 megavolts per meter. Uh, one question in terms of like when you were explaining the lighting, right? Why is the current going from the negative cloud to the positive? Shouldn't that be the other way around? So always the... Uh, these are electrons, right, from the cloud, that they will be attracted uh, to the positive charges on the ground. Okay, they will be attracted there. Any other questions? Yes, please. I'd like to ask if there's an easy way to calculate the breakdown field from epsilon r if we're not given it. No, the breakdown field, uh, you see, epsilon r and the break breakdown field represent two different uh, two different regimes of the operation of the dielectric. Uh, and again, if you refer back to mechanics uh, for the masses attached to the spring, there is Hooke's law that says force is equal K of the spring times displacement of the masses. And that tells you that if the force is not too strong, there is a linear relation between the displacement and the, uh, and the force. This is the regime where epsilon r makes sense because it is a linear relation between d and the electric field. In the dielectric breakdown now, the force has become so strong that you've gone away from this linear regime. And if you want to describe it, you would already have quadratic terms and other high order terms between the force and the displacement. And at some point now, there is actually the, uh, the, the dielectric does not behave as dielectric anymore. So the way that we determine these uh, values is experimental, is purely experimental. So you just keep increasing uh, the, vol uh, the voltage until uh, you observe a spark. Any other questions? OK, uh, so let me introduce then the next uh, um, topic that I will complete on uh, Wednesday, which is uh, boundary conditions for the electric field.
So, so far, we have seen electric fields in homogeneous spaces. That is, all the space is covered by a dielectric or it is free space and so on. So here's a question, what happens when I have a transition between two materials? In fact, we have seen such transitions, even in the simplest case of a capacitor. At this point right here, you have a transition between a dielectric, which can be uh, a dielectric or it can be pure air, and a conductor. So in such transitions, the electric field varies in an abrupt way. We have seen, for example, that the electric field is zero inside the conductor, but it's not non-zero outside. So therefore, we have these transitions that are described by specific boundary conditions on the electric field. So the general statement, the general problem is as follows, that I have an interface between two materials. The first material has the electric permittivity epsilon 1. The second has the electric permittivity epsilon 2. And I have, I take a point here on this, on this interface, and I'm being told that the electric field at this point on the side of the first material is E1. So the boundary condition is about determining what will be the electric field on the other side. So in other words, we're going at a point on the surface, and given the electric field underneath, we're looking for the electric field on the other side. This is a fundamental problem that uh, obviously here we see its most um, simple form, but in general, it is uh, very interesting uh, all the way from uh, electrostatics to optics, from DC to light, and particularly important uh, when uh, you pose this problem to understand how light refracts at, uh, at interfaces, at material interfaces in nature and in artificial media. So how do we set up this problem? The first step is actually to realize that no matter how this interface is formed, if it is curved or not curved or whatever form it takes, locally I can define a straight line tangent to the point and study that area alone. So this is uh, the tangent to the point I can define a unit vector that points, that is perpendicular to this interface. I call it n hat. And you see I am given this E1 and I want to find E2. There are these two fundamental directions at this interface the perpendicular, the normal direction, and the parallel direction. The one that pokes the interface and the other that skips the interface. So I will analyze the electric field here in these two components. So as I have this E1, I will analyze it So N here stands for normal, that is perpendicular to the interface. Perpendicular to the interface and um, parallel, if you wish, to this normal unit vector. 
and T stands for tangential. And that means parallel to the interface. So this is the first step. For example, let's say that we have an interface on the xy plane between two materials, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. And I have an electric field here. I have as a first step to analyze it into the normal component, which is the y component, and the tangential component, which is the x component. So this is what we call the e tangential. This is the e normal. So I will use this setup on Wednesday to complete the extraction of boundary conditions so that we see how these components individually translate from the one material to the other. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. And we'll see you on Wednesday.